Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kenya Stump, and with me today is Melissa Miracle, and we're going to take you through our solar siting potential initiative that we have here in Kentucky. So my name is Kenya Stump. I'm uh, the executive director of the Kentucky Office of Energy Policy. And I believe in the next slide, we're gonna go over a little bit about what our office does, where it's located and how this uh, project came to evolve. So we are located here at the Energy and Environment Cabinet in Kentucky, where our mission is to provide regulatory guidance, environmental awareness, and implement an energy strategy that'll bring economic benefit to the Commonwealth. We do this while protecting the environment and improving the quality of life for Kentucky businesses, workers, and the public in general. Our philosophy here in Kentucky is that energy and environmental issues are inextricably linked, and that is why we work hand in hand together on energy and environmental policy issues. My office here is the Kentucky Office of Energy Policy. We're a non-regulatory office as you can tell by our name, our focus is on energy policy. We want to really provide effective, creative, and flexible pathways forward and look to meet our energy needs in a, a holistic and integrated manner. We are non-regulatory. We support all Kentucky's energy resources and find ways to utilize those resources for the betterment of the Commonwealth while protecting and improving our environment. Central to our work is data and policy analysis. And even more core to that is our work that we do with our uh, environmental partners as it relates to energy and environmental GIS work, which is why we're here today. Next slide. So why did we look at solar site suitability in Kentucky? Um, many of you probably don't think of Kentucky when you think of solar. But we, as the cost of utility scale solar declined to the point of becoming competitive, especially as a least cost resource, we were seeing a lot of interest from developers uh, in the Commonwealth as siting locations for projects. Uh, it is land intensive compared to our other energy resources. And then that naturally brings up conversations around greenfield development, brownfield development, land use, and inevitably where do these projects make sense uh, from a technical feasibility standpoint. Next slide. So part of that is our cabinet is focused on energy and environmental justice issues. Many of our mining communities have uh, experienced uh, a disproportionate adverse impact as the market demand for our coal resources uh, have declined in, in the last 10 years. So we have a lot of mining lands um, that are looking for opportunities to be uh, revitalized and reused. And part of that is the conversation of um, can solar make sense on reclaimed mine sites? This tool was also there to really help prepare local governments to know does solar, large scale utility solar, um, is that feasible in their communities and how can they prepare for it? And then lastly, it does look at a kind of infrastructure gap analysis. When we look at areas that may not score as suitable, then what are those limiting infrastructure factors um, that come into play in that kind of analysis? Next slide. So now I'm really pleased to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Melissa Miracle who's gonna take you through our solar site suitability uh, hub site and um, how we came to develop it and a little bit of where we're going with site suitability in the state. Kenya, <clears throat> hi, I'm Melissa and I'm here to talk about the technology behind the solar siting project, but after watching two fantastic plenaries and a whole host of great information this week, I feel compelled to tie our presentation to the conference themes. 
Now, this project focuses on developing reclaimed coal mine lands to house a source of renewable energy, and clearly it has both sustainability and environmental justice themes running all through it. And as you know, these are clear themes of the conference. Um, but I also noticed in the secondary, the second plenary this week, an underlying theme of learning, planning, doing, and building on what you've done to reiterate that process and move forward. And I think you're gonna see that in the Kentucky Energy and Environment Cabinet, this is exactly what we're doing in our GIS projects. So how do we get started? Well, we began by gathering together a group of experts in our cabinet to talk about the data and information we wanna share with solar developers. And from that, we created those data we created layers and we published those as services. Those services were pulled into a web map and then we took that web map into the RGS web app builder and created a web app. Next, we took that web app and we shared it with our project team to get those experts to look at it and give us their feedback. We took that feedback and incorporated it into the viewer and then we showed it again to our management team. We wanted to get their feedback. We took feedback from our management team added to the app, and then we were ready to show it to our solar developers. We had a team of solar developers that we demoed this to, and they had a lot of great feedback to give us. We took all that and we finalized our app. But as we looked at all of the feedback we got from all of our stakeholders, we realized we had a lot more information we wanted to share than we could do in just a web app. So we decided to use ArcGIS Hub as a platform and to use it to showcase the web app, but to add all that other information we wanted to share. So this is a screen capture of our hub site and it is on the solar siting web app page, uh, which is called the suitability tool page. And now I'm just gonna take us over to a quick video to show the app. In this video, I will be doing a quick walkthrough of the solar siting potential in Kentucky map viewer that is located on the solar siting potential hub site on the suitability tool page. When you first come into the map, you have two layers that are visible at the statewide view. It's the filtered mine boundaries and the solar suitability model. If we look at the legend, we see that the filtered mine boundaries are the pink polygons and the solar suitability model is a raster that has all the modeling criteria that we explain in our project criteria page on the hub site. And it is represented by a color ramp that goes from green to orange, with green being the best siting potentials and orange being the worst. The gray on the map are areas that are not available for siting. There are other layers that are available, as you can see. We cannot see those at the statewide view, but when we zoom in, we will be able to see those. I'm going to zoom in by searching for a particular filtered mine boundary. Click on that, and now I can look at my layer list, and I can see that they're all turned on, except for the service areas and the farmland classifications. These particular layers were added because when we did our demo with the solar developers, they felt like these data would be important for them to have available in the map, but there are so many features in each layer that we by default have those turned off. Another feature that we've added is a slider. And this allows the user to slide the purple mine boundary polygons on or off the map. If I look at the pop-up for the filtered mine boundary, we've also added a few things to this layer that are visible in the pop-up. One of the key things is the possible acres, which is the number of acres that could possibly be used to create a solar farm based on the project criteria from the project criteria page, and also the total acres if I scroll down and click on this link to the permit info, this will open up a new page for the Surface Mining Information Systems public website. It goes straight to that particular coal company and I click on that company and then all of the publicly available permitting information is visible. I'm gonna go back to my map and show one last thing. And this is that we have all of the layers that are in the map we have the attributes data available to be viewed so the developer can hone in on a particular site and then see 
information from each of these layers. So now I want to talk a little bit about future work. Uh, we elevated this project by working on creating several 3D map scenes to add to the solar site. And I've got a couple of screen grabs so you can see what that looks like. We also continue to elevate, refine, and add to our project by creating a new project, which we're finalizing. It's a joint project with the Cabinet for Economic Development to do site suitability using the suitability modeler widget. And this is the same widget the US Forest Service demoed in the first plenary. Uh, it allows us to add a lot more layers, including social and environmental justice layers. And you can see a screen cap of a model that we ran using this widget with our unemployment rates laying on top of that. Now, as I mentioned, we, we saw this theme of uh, learning, planning, and doing, and we were now back to our learning phase. After doing all of this work, we realized that we have a couple of rock stars in our cabinet who can do this work, who can create rasters and, and work with imagery and do suitability modeling, but we need to train more people. So we're going to leverage our ESRI Advantage program to get more staff trained to do these kinds of things. And then we're planning to use ArcGIS Pro to do more in-depth spatial analysis and suitability modeling. And now I'm just leaving you with our contact information. Uh, to feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And we also have our URL as well as a QR code to our hub site. We really hope you go out and check the hub site out because in this short demo and time, we didn't have enough time to show you all of the, the great things about it. I just want to thank you for your time and attention.